Well, good morning, everyone. I can't tell you how great it is to hear the sound of chattering voices at the beginning of our service. And uh, certainly welcome to see you all this morning, bright and early. Um, it's certainly a bright day, and for me, it feels early. Anyway, uh, also, of course, a special welcome to all those who are watching uh, live stream from home. If you're able, please join and stand with me for this call to worship based on Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God has rescued us from trouble and has gathered us in from every land. The Lord hears our cry and delivers us from distress. He has sent out his word and has brought healing. We therefore give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. His loving deeds are for all humankind. I ask you to remain standing if you're able for our opening hymn, Lift High the Cross.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Eternal and ever faithful God, by your word you create and by your breath you give life. We worship you with joy and thanksgiving, praising you for the fullness that your presence brings to our lives and to our life together. We praise you that by your word you feed us and we are nourished. We praise you for your goodness that is displayed in your wonderful works for all humanity and in your perfect love which endures forever. We have seen your love expressed in the lives of the people of scriptures and uniquely in Jesus Christ who came into the world to reveal your love and your ways to the world. And we give you thanks that we have experienced your steadfast love in our own lives, even in times of darkness. Continue to lead us in your life-giving ways. Stir us with your spirit in this time of worship. Awaken our joy and reverence as we offer you our songs and silence, our prayers and praises. For you are our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. And let us continue with a prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess our sin and the sin of the world. We confess that we have sinned against you in the things we have done and in those things we have neglected to do as individuals, as churches, and as nations. We have held back from giving in order to protect what we have. We have not trusted in your goodness and have relied on the world's empty promises instead. Forgive what we have done and direct who we shall become. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear this good news. God so loved the world that he gave his beloved son, that all who turn to Jesus in hope and expectation may be born anew of the Spirit. Receive this good news and know today that you are offered life in Christ through whom we are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. And now we come to our announcements, and I encourage you to look at your bulletins. Again, thank you for those who are letting Liz know that you're coming each Sunday. That is appreciated, so please continue to do that. And I also remind you that on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we continue our series on Why Did Jesus Have to Die? If you're interested in joining, then do send me an email or a phone call. And on the back of the bulletin, there is news from Presbytery's last meeting in mid-February. I'm not going to go through all the details here. I just want you to be aware of what is happening in the churches in our area. So do look over that and see what is happening. And now Matthew will play for us, Lord, I lift your name on high.
you, Matthew. Let us pray. God of light and truth, send your Holy Spirit to move in us and among us this day. Speak to us through the scriptures, read and interpreted, so that they lead us to encounter your living word, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite John to come and read our scriptures to us this morning. Sorry, take two. Uh, it's from Numbers 21, uh, verses 4 to 9. They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the, to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up here out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Is, there is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelis died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked to the bronze snake, they lived. Our second reading is from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that, they, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. These are our readings. Thank you, John. Words of good news and words of challenge, as we will discover a little later. And now for our next hymn, beautifully sung by a soloist, O oh, love that wilt not let me go. I 
Last Sunday, I had a brief glance at the lectionary reading for today and was delighted to discover that it contained one of the most loved verses in the New Testament, John chapter 3, verse 16. I relaxed a little too quickly, thinking that it would be a straightforward topic to preach on. On Tuesday, I looked at the passage in more detail and realize that this week's gospel reading is a minefield. And that can often be the way it is. <clears throat> Not just with John's gospel, <clears throat> but with much of the Bible. In that many people wish, just like Thomas Jefferson, that they could edit it with a pair of scissors, keeping the bits that they like and discarding the rest. Yet if we want to remain faithful to the Bible, which the global Christian community itself considers to be authoritative, then we have to keep it all. And if we do that, I think we'll discover the richness of the whole Bible, as well as appreciate how its various pieces fit together, sometimes harmoniously and sometimes with contrasting tensions. And today's reading is perhaps more of the latter. As we approach this passage, I suggest that we have in the back of our minds the image of family life, one that contains both love and discipline. Both are vitally important in raising healthy children. And if we like one and not the other, well, we know all about that. In John's language, we're talking about love and judgment. We like the love aspect, but we're not so sure about the judgment. And in John, this duo is imaged by contrasting light with darkness. You can't have one without the other. And also bear in mind that John's perspective is somewhat black and white with no shades of gray. Let's explore. 
Our reading leaps into the latter part of the famous conversation that Jesus had with the intelligent inquirer, Nicodemus. Jesus tells him, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. What does that mean? Well, as we heard from John earlier, during Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, they encountered a plague of poisonous snakes, and many people were bitten and died. The people threw themselves upon the mercy of God and acknowledged their sinful grumbling towards God and towards Moses. And as we heard, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And so Moses did just that. And anyone who was bitten by the snake looked at the bronze snake and we're told that they lived. God provided the means of healing. Curiously, God's provision was not a natural predator for snakes. The healing involved a human response. Incidentally, we're later told that the bronze serpent was stored in the tabernacle as a sacred object. Much later, King Hezekiah discovered that people were worshipping it, and so he broke it into pieces as part of his reforms. That shows that what starts off as a wholesome means of salvation can sometimes become distorted and turned into superstitious idolatry. A later Jewish writer found it necessary to emphasize that it wasn't the bronze serpent itself that healed the Israelites, but the saving power of God. And this reminds us of the need to look beyond symbols and appreciate the divine message and power behind them. That said, John makes the parallel with the bronze serpent in that the Son of Man must also be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus is referring to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And this symbolism can be understood as the cross being medicine that makes us well. We have been stricken by a deadly disease, sin. And the only cure is to look at Jesus dying on the cross and to find life by trusting in him. As it says in Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. The cross then provides healing and restoration. I'll talk more about that later. John also says that by trusting in the cross of Jesus, we will have eternal life. And this doesn't mean endless duration in, to human existence, but it's a way of describing life as lived in the unending presence of God. To have eternal life is to be given life as a child of God, or using the language of the other gospel writers, to become part of the kingdom of God. And this new life isn't something that starts after we die. It starts now. As John says later, eternal life is to know God and Messiah Jesus, whom God sent. And to be born from above, or to be born again, as Jesus says to Nicodemus, arises through lifting up Jesus on the cross. And then Jesus summarizes it all, saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Those two verses announce the why of Jesus' life and his death. God gave Jesus to the world because God loves the world. As the song that Matthew played puts it, Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way, to which, of course, the gospel writer John would agree. Jesus is unique. He is God's one and only. And that particularity needs to be contrasted with the inclusiveness of the whoever of God's invitation. God's gracious initiative is for everyone. God's intent is to rescue the whole world through Jesus, not to condemn the world. Even so, God's love does not coerce. The purpose of Christ's coming is to bring life, not death. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the gift of life must be accepted and it can be refused. John goes on to talk about the world's response in binary terms of darkness and light. Jesus is the light of the world, but the very presence of light inevitably creates shadows. And even though the light itself shines out and it cannot be overcome by darkness, it's still possible to shut out the light and create areas of darkness where Jesus can be avoided and evil can continue. John then says, people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For those who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may be exposed. If we don't want our actions to be seen by Jesus, we have to ask, why is that? Yet let's be reassured, if we are willing to live as children of the light, there's absolutely nothing to fear. What this also means is that divine love is contrasted with judgment. And many people find that uncomfortable. But we are in the season of Lent. And this topic is proclaimed not to induce feelings of guilt, but as an opportunity to reflect and, if need be, to repent and to celebrate God's love revealed in Jesus Christ and so respond appropriately. John's audience saw judgment as a positive thing. It meant that all that was wrong in the world was going to be finally put right and evil would be vanquished forever by a good God. Put in a different way, justice is an outcome of divine, sorry, judgment is an outcome of divine justice. And so we're trying to balance here God's love and God's justice. I've said before, we all want God's grace for ourselves and God's justice applied to others. But we can also respond here with what about isms? For example, what about those of other faiths? In response to that, I suggest that those of other faiths were not on John's radar here. If anything, John was concerned about those Jews who had rejected Jesus as the Messiah and would like to persuade them otherwise. So let's not get sidetracked by John's words or see them out of context. And let's also remember that Jesus himself is the final judge, for God has delegated that task to him. And that, I believe, brings hope because our judge is someone who knows from first-hand experience the complexities of the human condition. I have personal confidence that the ascended Jesus, 
who is sometimes referred to in the Bible as the wisdom of God and who knows all that can be known is the right person to lovingly balance divine mercy and justice. Frankly, I don't know how Jesus, the good shepherd, is going to do that, but I trust that he can and will. Now let's go back to that image of Jesus as medicine for sin, that his being lifted on the, up on the cross provides healing and restoration. I like this image of restoration because it resonates. Many people love to restore things rather than to simply scrap them because they perceive of some inherent value within those items that is worth lovingly saving. It could be an old car, a classic car maybe, or a piece of furniture, a musical instrument, a painting, a building, etc. And yes, the restoration process is costly in terms of time, money, and commitment. But it's really an act of love, one that, when it's complete, many others can appreciate. I also think that we need to revision God's justice, not as punishment, but as restoration. I think God's, God thinks creation and rebellious humankind are worth restoring, putting right what has gone wrong, including restoring relationships and restoring God's good creation. That's the goal. Restorative healing is a long, transformative process. Are we in or are we out? God's rescue plan is also costly, but God evidently thinks it's worth it. For God so loved the world that he came himself in the form of Jesus Christ to personally pay the price of healing our brokenness. He was lifted up on the cross and everyone who actively trusts in him, in his act of saving, receives life and are called children of God. Again, are we in or are we out? That's God's restorative justice, one that also reveals the depths of the Creator's love for creation. What is our response? As we recall the words of the Good Friday hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, may our response be that of its writer, Isaac Watts. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And that also means our trusting in the cross is demonstrated in our working to reveal, reveal and reflect the light of Christ to all those who are around us. Or, in the words of our opening hymn, are we willing to lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, giver of all light and life, you sent Jesus Christ into the world not to condemn but to save. Help us this day to look again to the cross and live, to trust in Jesus, the person, his message, and in his death and resurrection. May we respond to that costly love with devotion and commitment knowing that Christ died for everyone and each of us knowing that Christ died for us and that makes it personal. Lord, we know that there is much symbolism to explore in the meanings of the cross. May we be inspired by this notion of healing and restoration and so follow in Christ's footsteps. 
Help us to lift up the light of Christ so that the world might believe in him and receive the gift of life with you now and always. Gracious God, you are our shepherd who walks with us through every valley. Be with us today as we mark one year of this global pandemic. Be the comfort for those who grieve. Be the strength of those who are faltering. Give us hope to keep moving forward with patience and kindness. We give thanks for the progress made. Help us to continue to trust you today and always. We pray for peace and safety in the world, for countries struggling to care for their citizens and to rebuild their economies, and for all who do not receive the respect and consideration they deserve as your children, for all who are persecuted for their beliefs, for all who are disenfranchised and who long to live in freedom. May all these know your grace and mercy, your peace and justice. We pray for your church around the world and for the congregations we know, for the faithful ministries they lead during this time of health restrictions, and for new creative ministries that have arisen during this pandemic. We also pray for wisdom for church leaders in their planning. May your church in its many expressions, shine ever more brightly in the darkness, revealing your love and healing to the world. Lord, we pray for those who are dear to us and who brighten our days. And we also pray for those who are struggling with isolation or frustration and for those who experience illness and pain in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who grieve. We pray especially today for Liz, Graham, Kathleen, Aggie, the men at the boarding house, and for others known to us in a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, heal the broken places of life. We give you thanks for those whose well-being is improving. And may we witness your spirit at work in grace and power so that your glory is revealed. We also lift up to you the concerns of our hearts today for the fears and frustrations that we struggle with for troubled relationships, for doubts and hopes that compete within us. May we all know with conviction that you are with us day by day. The God who listens, we thank you that you have heard the cries of your people. You have felt our despair and our fears, and in your love you, had offered us, you have offered us hope and renewal. You are at work in your church and in the world, so that all that stands broken will one day be made new. Generous God, pour out your spirit upon us today that we may be faithful to you as you are steadfastly faithful to us. We pray to you in the name of the one who came to show us the way, he who is our Lord and Redeemer, our brother and our friend, and the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Our final hymn today is Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. like there was a bit of Welsh there I think at the end. (laughs) Let's rejoice for God loves the world. Just as Jesus came into the world to heal and restore, so God sends us into the world this day to be the light and love, healing and hope. Therefore let's go and reflect Christ's light to the world with energies refreshed And may the grace and peace of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.